This video is about how I personally go about the decision making process when it comes to landings that don't have a specific set of rules or landing patterns that govern them, i.e. landings away from bases or airports. I'll walk you through the procedure I follow for these landings and take a look at some examples along the way. First, let's get an overview for the procedure I follow and after that we'll go more in depth of the procedure as I break it down point by point. Recon Surrounding Area While orbiting the LC, I do a recon of the surrounding area to choose the best angle or direction to approach the LC. Recon LC itself I move in a little closer while still circling in the air to make an assessment of where I think the best landing spot is within the LC and I get an idea of where exactly I want to place the helicopter on the ground. Approach After I have an informed opinion of how I want to approach the area, and where I want to be on the ground after landing, I set up for the approach itself. Landing spot check. After the approach and before sending the helicopter all the way down, I verify the assessments of the slope was somewhat correct and that I have sufficient clearance to obstacles. Set down. If everything looks acceptable, set down. If not, make adjustments or go around. This is the procedure I follow at all unfamiliar landing spots. It is important to take your time with this procedure, especially in the beginning. Overlooking things in the landing spot will happen, but by taking your time to execute this procedure thoroughly, you can avoid most incidents and uncomfortable surprises. Let's break it down and go a little more in depth at each point in the procedure. The main point of this phase is to choose where to approach the LC from and is done while circling about 100 to 200 meters out from the LZ at about 300 to 500 feet AGL. While circling, I mainly look for houses, people and animals, the position of the sun, the elevation of the surrounding terrain, and surrounding obstacles. Houses and people I try to always avoid both for noise abatement reasons and also the obvious reason that should there be an emergency where you have to land immediately, you can do so without having to think about readjusting your position or having to worry about potentially causing harm to people on the ground. The position of the sun plays a big role in choosing the approach path. Coming in with the sun in your eyes effectively blinding you can be very dangerous. I will almost always try to come in from an angle that mitigates the effect the sun has on my vision. The elevation of the surrounding terrain I mainly consider because I want the approach to be only as steep as necessary. This is to better get an idea of the slope of the landing spot and also gauge the height of potential obstacles and the LZ while I am shooting the approach. Surrounding obstacles like towers, tall trees, and every sort of wire I try not to overfly if I can choose. Sometimes you have to, but especially when it comes to wires in low vis conditions like rain, snow, or light fog, range estimation to them is hard and can be quite uncomfortable. When it comes to wind, I usually don't consider it too much unless it's quite strong. In smaller helicopters you have to, but there is so much power reserve in the H125 that it is usually not a factor if you just limit your vertical speed and go slow. Of course, if I can choose, I choose a headwind. But I would much rather come in with a strong tailwind or sidewind instead of, for example, coming in with the sun in my eyes. So let's look at an example of an LC where I identify each point that we just went over and choose an approach angle based on that information. There are not many people around except for the customers we were flying for on this mission that were in the LC itself. There are no houses or animals to consider in the surrounding area. The sun has set behind the mountains, so there is no chance of getting blinded by it no matter which way I choose to come in. The surrounding terrain does not have much elevation except for this little knoll to the left in the picture. There are tall trees all around this parking lot, so no matter which way I choose to come in, I have to overfly them. But there are also power lines stretching over the LC from the left to the right which I have to consider. The power lines played the biggest factor in this example in my choosing of the approach path. I chose to shoot my approach from the right towards the left in this picture into the landing spot between the two cars. 
That way I could keep the power lines in sight on my left the whole time while I was on approach. It was also the direction that allowed for the most shallow approach angle, letting me get the best idea of the slope on the landing spot itself. Before leaving the base to go do a job at an unfamiliar site, I look up satellite photos if we have the coordinates of the LC. This gives me the first impression of the area surrounding the landing even before taking off. It can also help give you quite a good idea of the LC itself. In this phase I move a little closer while circling to get a better view of how I want to position and fit the helicopter on the ground inside the LC. During this phase I mainly look for slopes and obstacles in the LC itself. I will try to position the helicopter so that the slope is either nose up or sideways since those are the directions that allow for the steepest slopes and if possible I want to keep the obstacles in view so that I have a better idea of my distance from them. When judging how the helicopter is going to fit I find it very useful to think of how big the helicopter is in regards to things I know the general size of and that can often be seen on the ground like cars, people, snowmobiles, tractors, etc. If the area is clear of obstacles and about 5 by 5 car lengths or about 25 by 25 meters, I consider it a pretty spacious area. That means I can orient the helicopter to land in any direction I want if the slope permits. But a lot of the time you don't have that much room. The main dimensions to consider are the following. Total length and width of the helicopter, clearance from the ground up to both spinning and stop rotor disc, clearance from ground up to tail rotor guard, and the area required by the skids. This is a lot of numbers to remember, so again, I think of how big the helicopter is in regards to things I know the general size of. First, I want to look at the example we used from before. The obstacles to consider in this LC are the power lines and the light post taken up. The slope is tilting towards the river, so I want to land nose up in this example to better have a view of the car that is going to end up on my right, while also keeping the light post right in front. If we are landing nose up, that means that we'll have the tail towards the power lines when we set down and have them in our blind spot. To make sure that we have enough room in that direction, I look at the car with the trailer already parked here. This is where measuring by things you know the general size of comes in. To allow for some safety margin, Let's say the helicopter needs about two times the length of the car and trailer together. As we can see, we can fit two of those car and trailer lengths in that direction. Regarding the width needed, there is easily enough room, but just for the sake of the exercise, we can say it needs about one car and trailer length in that direction, which there is plenty of room for. Regarding the skids, the area is flat and the skids have the area they require. Let's look at another example where the helicopter is already on the ground. This LC is much tighter and won't allow us to land however we choose. In this case, with cars and potential people coming out of the cars, I don't want to have the tail towards that and additionally have them in my blind spot. I also don't want the logs under my tail rotor and I can't put the tail towards the loads that are laid out for us. There is very little slope to consider, but the ground is muddy and wet, so we choose what looks like the dry spot. So in this case, a lot of the decisions were made for us and we only had to make sure that there was enough room for us. Also in this example you can see how helpful it is to gauge the size of the helicopter in relation to cars. Going back to the first example, I have gathered the information I require about the slopes, obstacles and size, and I'm confident that the helicopter is going to fit. So now we can set up for the approach. While shooting the approach, the main thing is to choose a speed that allows me to keep the recon going as I'm getting closer to the LC. If I notice something new, like a crossing wire that I didn't see before in the initial recon, or for example there is a loose plastic tarp on the ground that looks problematic, I can go around and maybe find an alternative LC. The closer you get, the better idea you are going to get about what the slope is and what the height and distance to obstacles are. To get the best idea, I use an approach angle that is only as steep as necessary, or only as steep as the surrounding terrain and obstacles require it to be. The shallower approach angle, the better it is for judging the LC. Let's look at the approach I chose to the area from the first example when we looked at the recon of the surrounding area. My speed is a little high in this example. To me this is a known area and we had already landed here twice earlier in the day. Going in here for the first time my speed was probably around half.
This approach direction allows me to keep the power lines in view during the approach, while also coming in from the direction that has the least amount of obstacles. That way, I can keep a relatively shallow angle compared to an approach from the opposite side. An approach perpendicular to the power lines would have ended in a high hover directly over the spot, with a final vertical approach to the setdown point. Going in vertical is the hardest way to judge the slope, and I don't really use it unless I've already landed in that spot earlier, or the area is confined and require a vertical approach. We are getting very close to landing, so let's take a look at the landing spot check. Depending on how big the LC is, and if there is room for it, I try to come into an in-ground effect hover before reaching my spot to do a last confirmation that the spot looks good enough for a set down. If there's no room to come to a hover before reaching the spot, I sometimes come to a hover beyond my intended set down point to do a spot check there before repositioning for landing. If there is no more room than what you need for the helicopter itself, and no room to move around, I often slow down on final approach, and if I feel it is beneficial, I come to an out of ground effect hover to do my spot check there. If everything looks acceptable, I move on to the landing itself. In the final phase, I will very gently put the helicopter down to make sure I was right about the amount of slope. If you have a task specialist or loadmaster with you, it is common practice to have them open the door and clear your left side and tail rotor while you focus on the right side and the front. Proper slope landing technique is important to get a nice controlled and gradual set down. The task specialist will let you know if the clearance margin becomes unacceptable as the helicopter gets closer and closer to the ground. If you're alone and you are not sure that you are getting enough clearance, you need to abort the landing and go around. As with many things in aviation, proper setup, preparation, and information gathering will make your tasks a lot easier. The same goes for landings. Landings at unfamiliar spots is oftentimes the most critical part of an operation whether it is to pick up passengers or to land at a site for a sling loading job. There are many variables and a lot of factors to consider. I think the most important point I can make in this video is to take your time and establish solid habits and procedures for unfamiliar landings. By following a proper procedure, the instances of overlooking something and getting an uncomfortable surprise will be significantly fewer and further in between.